This is Lemmy with Revzilla. Today we're talking about Harley handlebars. Now, if you've looked into swapping a set of handlebars on your Harley Davidson, you know this task could be potentially quite daunting. Now, people change handlebars on Harleys really for two main reasons. First, they want their bike to look different, and secondly, they want their hands to be in a different position. Happily, if you select the right handlebar, you can knock out two birds with one stone. So today, we're gonna to be talking about a couple things you wanna consider before you select a handlebar, and I'll also show you a couple tips and techniques that might make the actual installation process just a little bit easier. Now, you should know that most of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today is gonna be applicable generally for Harley Davidsons from the 70s right up through modern times. If you've got a much older bike, we're probably not going to be that much help to you, but I guess that's probably not too many of you out there in the audience. Let's move into our first topic, handlebar diameter. Now before you buy anything or before you start ripping your motorcycle apart, you really should head over to your toolbox and grab yourself a measuring device. This is a dial caliper. I think it's probably the easiest way to rapidly figure out what diameter a handlebar is. And you're gonna wanna take a couple measurements in the bar in a couple different places, and we'll talk about where those places are in just a moment, but ascertaining your diameter is very important. Now before we get into most of the mainstream stuff, we're gonna start off with kind of a fruitcake. If you should happen to have a street, you should know that you have seven eighths inch bars. Traditionally, that's not a size that comes on Harley Davidson's. Now for the rest, of you who are on sort of the more traditional air-cooled Harley Davidsons, I think that you're probably almost all going to have some sort of one inch bar on your bike in some form or fashion. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but natively speaking, Harley Davidsons are one inch bars. And I'll show you kind of an easy example, and that's this aftermarket set of bars we have in these aftermarket risers here. These are one inch risers, this is a one inch bar. And we say that, we mean that this is a one inch diameter continuously throughout the tubing. It doesn't vary in its diameter at any point. Now, shift over to a set of bars like these, and we're gonna see a couple different diameters in here. So if we look out here at the control area, these are one inch in diameter. Again, uh, most Harleys are natively one inch. I think just about everyone is gonna need one inch out here, um, but you do wanna check this area, make sure that you have one inch bars here. However, if we look down at the uprights, you'll notice these jump up in diameter. These are a larger diameter. Now this is done specifically for looks. A lot of people like sort of that big, burly, beefy look, and these bars provide those. Now notice here, when this makes the transition, this is called a swage. You'll is sort of a gentle taper. If you should see a bar that's described as being swaged, this is exactly what that is describing, sort of that gentle taper, rather than what we have down here at the riser area. If you look, this is called a step. This is a stepped bar. You might also see them called slugged bars. What this indicates is that one size tubing is fitting into another tube here. This is absolutely critical for you to measure, simply because the clamping area of the bar might not be the same diameter as the visible uprights. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because there are several different diameters. There are are some bars that are continuous through the clamping area. If you plan on changing from say a one inch to a one and a quarter, you need to be aware of what the clamping area is because you may have to also purchase different risers. One other important note, if you do have a bar, again, where the clamping diameter is one inch and it's, that's smaller than the surrounding bar, instead of running a two piece riser like you can see here, this is actually incorrect. We would not run this on a motorcycle. We'd use something like this with a one piece top clamp. And the reason is it will cover up that narrower section, giving the illusion of a nice smooth continuous diameter all the way through the bar. Let's move on to our next section. Now, if there's one measurement when it comes to handlebars that's gonna make a huge impact in terms of both how your hands feel on the bars as well as the visual sort of presence of the motorcycle, that's gonna be rise. And I think most Harley riders are generally trying to add rise. They wanna add more rise to their handlebars, change where their hands sit, change how the bars look on the bike. Now, just so we're all clear, we're all on the same page here. When we're talking about rise, that measurement is generally taken from the center line of the mounting point to the center line of where your hands are actually gonna sit. That vertical measurement there, that drop or that rise is exactly what's being described when you're looking at a set of handlebars. Now, if you're gonna put a lot of rise onto your bike, if you're gonna add in a set of handlebars that have some rise, you need to know a few things because there's some costs and some complexities that can come along with that job in terms of both installation as well as in terms of how much you're gonna to need to open your wallet up. And the first has to do with cables and wiring. If you're gonna add lots and lots of rise, your cables and your wiring, all of your controls, aren't necessarily going to reach the new height that you've set your handlebars at. So if you're throwing lots and lots to rise at your bike, you should probably know and plan for the addition of a cable kit as well as a wiring kit. The installation can be a little bit of a pain on those. It does sort of increase the complexity of the job, but it shouldn't be too bad. You do need to know though that that is a thing, especially if you're adding lots and lots of rise. Now, another cost or complexity that can also sort of come up comes back to risers. So I'm gonna go back to our bad example bars here. Now, we talked earlier about how we wouldn't normally use a two-piece riser on a bar like this simply because we're trying to cover up this area here, but there's another reason we'd use 
use different risers on here as well. And that's because we also need greater clamping power. So instead of using a two piece top clamp, like you can see here, we have two separate pieces. We would use a one piece top clamp on here to provide greater clamping power. Now, another bar construction feature we'd also wanna look for, again, if, um, if you are thinking about putting on a high rise bar, another one you wanna look for is knurling. You wanna make sure the bars you're getting are knurled. Knurling is this cross hatched pattern that's machined into the handlebars. It allows the bars to get a kind of a bite on the risers and it allows the risers to get a better bite on the handlebars. That's important because as the bars get taller, you're able to exert more and more leverage upon that point down there. So you wanna give those bars and risers every chance you can to make sure that those things can grab each other and you don't have bars slipping inside the risers. It's annoying, it's also severely unsafe. Now another consideration that's also sort of related to that too are riser bushings. Riser bushings are these isolators Harley installs into the triple trees of most of their motorcycles. Not every single one, but most bikes do have riser bushings installed. Now the ones out of the factory are gonna be rubber, sort of like these ones. If you're putting a set of low rise bars onto your bike, uh, a fresh set of riser bushings is usually a good idea just because they tend to kind of blow out anyway, but rubber works out really well because it sort of absorbs that vibration. However, if you're putting on something with a big tall rise, you might wanna consider another material. You can get your hands on something like a urethane bushing. Urethane will not be quite so good at uh, vibration absorption. However, what it does do is holds up a little bit better to the increased leverage, again, that a set of high rise bars will actually provide. Now, for those of you who are going super sky high like these ones you can see here too, you may also wanna give some very serious thought to a set of steel riser bushings. So steel riser bushings are good in that they're fairly permanent. Throw a set of these in, they're gonna be the last set you ever buy for your motorcycle. They're not so great in that they're not very awesome at, you know, sort of soaking up that vibration that Harley gets with the rubber bushing. So you do sort of have to balance out there what's important to you, having a big tall set of bars or vibration absorption. Again, you can shoot the middle with urethane if necessary. Now, after watching all this, some of you guys are saying, well, this is way more difficult than I planned on. What's the easy solution here if I wanna make my bike look cool, but I don't wanna buy all this stuff and I don't wanna have this major installation project? Well, for folks like that, I usually recommend something like a Biltwell handlebar. Just about all of the handlebars made by Biltwell are kind of a direct swap into most Harleys because they don't have crazy rise. They're usually able to use lots of stock cable and wiring setups. You don't have to re-engineer your entire bike to use most Biltwell bars. So I would say check that brand out pretty heavily if you're looking for kind of an easy swap. Let's move on to the next section. The next measurements to consider are pullback and sweep. These are probably two of the more important determinants in terms of comfort. It really, these two measurements really kind of fine tune how comfortable you're gonna be on your bike. So we'll start out here with a broomstick bar, kind of a class of drag bar. And you'll notice this is just a straight piece of tubing. We have no pullback here and we have no sweep. Now let's contrast that in terms of pullback with these bars you can see over here. What pullback describes is sort of the offset between the area where your hands sit and the center line of the mounting point of the bar. So basically they move the bars effectively closer to you. This is gonna be important for those of you who feel like your arms are either too long or too short for the setup on your bike. You should be looking at different offset numbers there or different pullback. Now sweep on the other hand is actually the angle sort of that your wrists are going to sit at. So of course if we were on a bike on these broomstick bars, you know, your, your hands would have zero degrees of sweep. There'd be no sweep. But if you wanted your wrists tilted outward a little bit, that would be indicative of sweep. So if you can imagine yourself actually kind of pointing of view sitting behind these handlebars, you can see that these do have a little bit of sweep to them. You should also know too, if sweep is a sort of a comfort issue for you, and I know for a lot of people it really can be, that there are actually some bars out there on the market that offer adjustable sweep. These particular bars, for instance, will actually swing back and forth and sweep is adjustable on these handlebars. So you should know exactly what those things are. Once you sort of get into a couple of handlebars you're comfortable with, you'll know exactly what characteristics you're looking for in a handlebar. Now another consideration when you're purchasing a set of handlebars, believe it or not, is actually your front end style. Now 99% of you are probably gonna be zipping around on a standard telescoping hydraulic Harley front end. However, if you have one of the bikes Harley put out between the mid 80s and about the mid aughties, um, that would be a Springer, you've got sort of a different setup than other folks out there. So if you have a Harley Springer on your bike, you need to keep in mind that your front end setup and thus your handlebars are not exactly the same as your hydraulic brethren. Here, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. 
So we've got a set of risers here, and this is specifically for a hydraulic setup. Note that the spacing here, three and a half inches on center. Now, if we hold this up to a set of regular hydraulic handlebars, you'll notice these things line up beautifully. However, this won't work on a Springer, and I'll show you specifically why. What we're looking at right here is a Springer top clamp. Center to center distance on these is actually four and three quarters inches. So if we held that up to that knurling, it's not gonna work. You're gonna have knurling hanging out where it's not doing any good and it's gonna look all silly. That's no good. Instead, if you check out these bars here, you'll notice this matches up perfectly. That's because these particular handlebars are specifically made for a Springer. So the lesson here, kind of the takeaway, is that if you do have a bike with a Springer on the front of it, you wanna make sure that you're ordering bars for a Springer as well. Now this also extends to the risers. Here, let's grab some risers. These are specifically for a Springer, and I'll show you these in just a moment. But come back to these puppies, we look at our hydraulic risers, the bolts go up inside those threaded pieces there. That's not so with a Springer. With a Springer, instead, the risers set on top of the top clamp and the bolt actually comes in from the top. Then the bars sit on top of that and then the riser top clamp goes on there. It's a totally different setup. Now you can use these interchangeably if you have a hydraulic front end. There are some Springer style risers that will work depending on how your bike is set up. But you should know if you have a Springer, you need Springer risers specifically. All right, now we're gonna talk about some sort of secondary construction features that are a little bit more model specific, but still important nonetheless. The first one is going to be how your throttle is actuated. It's something you need to pay careful attention to. In the Harley world, you usually have sort of two setups here. You're either gonna have a cable style throttle or you're gonna have TBW or throttle by wire. You need to check to see which your bike is equipped with to make sure you get the right handlebars. And you also need to find out what you have in case you're using a different set of handlebars, you'll know how to adapt. So I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here. If you look at this this particular handlebar on the throttle side of the bike, you'll notice these castellations, these notches cut out of here. These notches are specifically so the TBW electronic unit can actually slide down in there and grab the handlebar. Now you need these, again, if you have a throttle by wire unit, but if you're trying to use a set of bars like this on a bike that's a cable style throttle, well, you've also got a little bit of work to do. You're gonna have to purchase an optional plug that actually fits in there and corresponds with those in order to extend the bar out just a little bit. You see there's a difference actually in length in the center line of the bike, so you're gonna need that plug if you're going to run a TBW style bar on a cable throttle motorcycle. Now another model specific feature you're going to want to look for too is fairing kick. If you happen to have a fared motorcycle, whether you're on a road glide, a street glide, an electric glide, there are special bars for you. These construction features vary just a little bit, but almost all of them are going to have this kick. Remember before when we talked about offset? A lot of that offset on these particular ones, again, comes from this special bend here that helps clear the fairing on your batwing style bikes, the electric glide and the street glide. You're you're also gonna to see too, the Shark Nose bikes, Road Glides also have their own special fairing bend. If you have one of those bikes, you're gonna to wanna to look for model specific bars for them. One of the other things you'll notice too is they have a really wide spread between the uprights, again, to kind of clear some of the things that are in the way on the motorcycle. Now we're still not done yet. If you're riding a non-fared bike, you've also got a couple things to pay attention to as well. So let's go back to our Z bars we used here just a little bit earlier. These are a very basic bar. You can see here we've just got plain tubing, nothing going on here. However, if you pick up another set of bars, let's say these keystones we've got here, you'll notice we've got dimples in here. This is referred to as a dimple. And this is specifically made so that you can use your factory controls on your motorcycle. So this set of Z bars back here, this is phenomenal for those of you who are building a chopper. You're not gonna have any electrical stuff up in the bars. Maybe you're running a suicide setup. It's gonna be fine for that. However, for those of you who have a bike that's a little bit closer to stock and you wanna use your stock clamshells, you're gonna need to make sure that you have dimpling in the bar. So if you see that option, you know what you're looking at. Now we can take this a step further if we look at these handlebars again. Notice that these have the dimple, but note there's also a hole in here too. You're gonna to see this referred to as either a drilled bar or a slotted bar. Now that drill or that slotted area there exists specifically so you can internally wire your bars. Some Harley motorcycles come into the factory with internal wiring. Other people wanna retrofit and they wanna internally wire their handlebars for that clean look. So this is exactly what you're looking at here. You'll notice, again, you're gonna see one of these slots or drill holes on either side. You're also gonna see another one down here between the risers. This is where they actually exit the bars between the risers and head down to the frame and make their way down the rest of the bike. Now, a couple things to note here. If you plan on internally wiring your handlebars, it's a little bit of a fiddly job. It can be kind of a pain. So here's a quick tip for you. Grab yourself one of these, go find your local guitarist, grab strings from them. They always have old strings to throw away. These make great fishing tools if you're trying to internally wire some bars. 
Another tip I'll offer you is if you are internally wiring bars, try and use a bar that's designed like this one. This is a bent bar. Notice that every time the contour changes here, it's this nice soft bend. These are put through a tubing bender. If we go back to our other bars over here, note that these bends are actually hard corners. And that's because if you look here, you'll actually see a weld. This is what's called a mitered bar. They make the bend not by bending it, but by actually welding two pieces at an angle and putting them together. Those corners though can be really difficult to internally wire. So if you're hell bent on internally wired bars, understand that you'll probably wanna go with something that's a bent bar rather than a mitered style. They get particularly bad if you get um, angles in the bar that are acute, less than 90 degrees. They can be really, really fiddly to wire those up. Now let's round out with a couple of install considerations and bring this thing home. All right, let's chat about a few installation considerations that might make your life a little bit easier. A lot of these lessons I learned the hard way. Hopefully you don't have to do the same thing. The first is this, a blanket. This should be the first thing you reach for before you ever even open your toolbox. Throw it over your tank. It protects the sheet metal, protects the paint, protects a lot of things. I can't tell you how often I've dropped something onto a tank and ruined something simply because I didn't have a blanket. Don't learn this lesson the hard way. Now kind of related to this, let's clear this out of the way. Kind of related to this, is the concept of clearance. Remember, we're replacing non-stock parts on a motorcycle. There's no guarantee everything's gonna go together the same way if we do it correctly. For instance, case in point, we put some aftermarket handlebars on our Sportster here. We flip the mirrors over. If you'll notice, when we go all the way to the steering lock, that mirror clears the tank. The mirror clears the tank because I made sure of that before this thing ever got outside. The reason I'm bringing this up is that it's not a guarantee, of course, that things are gonna go together like that. You may find you need to reposition items. You wanna check clearances. On the road is a bad way to find out that something doesn't give you the clearance you need in order to keep going. It's also not so great either if you're in the driveway and you wind up smashing something up pretty on your motorcycle. Now, the next tip I'm gonna mention to you seems probably kind of generic, but it does have some truth to it, and that's custom bike problems get custom bike solutions. The reason I'm mentioning this is that, again, this isn't all Bolton. What's seems like it should be a very simple bar swap, can kind of spiral out of control very, very quickly. For instance, let's say we were putting on a set of taller bars here and we needed to throw on a cable and wiring kit. That requires a fair amount of work and you're gonna need mechanical prowess beyond simple bolt turning to do that. It's gonna involve adjusting your throttle cables, replacing and adjusting your clutch cable. You're gonna have obviously some wiring work there and you're also gonna be bleeding a brake most likely. So there are other skill sets that you're gonna need in order to do this and I think all of them can come in handy. You just need to be aware that your wrenching ability does need to be sort of proportional to the parts you wanna install and how different and how far away from stock you're actually going to get. Now let's move over to this puppy, the dresser. I have some specific tips for those of you who are rocking a bagger. Really, if you're doing this, you wanna have a plan. Kind of plan your work and work your plan. And the reason I'm saying this is because it takes a lot of time to get into the fairing of one of these motorcycles. Whether you're doing this yourself in your own garage or you're paying a shop to do it, someone is gonna spend a lot of time turning wrenches here. So while you're inside the fairing, I would suggest replacing some other items. We already talked about riser bushings earlier. This is a perfect candidate for new riser bushings. It's an item that's often neglected neglected on dressers simply because it's so hard to get to. So if you have sloppy feeling bars right now because there's play in the bushings, this would be a great time to replace them. Similarly, there's some other common failure points inside the fairing. I'm thinking specifically of the fairing support brackets that run along in here. Harley had a big problem with these for a pretty long time. Um, sometimes they crack. Yeah, you can weld your stock ones back together, replace them with OEM, but also look to the aftermarket too. There are polymer replacements that are much stronger. It'll eliminate a lot of that noise and rattling and vibration. You may be getting out of the front of your fairing simply because your fairing support brackets have cracked. In the same vein, you might also want to think about audio. Remember, when you're actually inside of here, you've got a stereo, this is a perfect opportunity to swap it out. Same goes for speakers. If you were thinking about getting a new stereo upgrade, this is the time to do it. Again, you're probably going to spend more money up front here. However, it's going to be more inexpensive in the long run simply because you're going to knock all this out with one labor job rather than repeated trips inside of the fairing. So at this stage of the game, I would say probably most of you should feel pretty comfortable because you know a lot of the stuff that you're going to need to know to successfully purchase as well as install a set of handlebars on your Harley Davidson. However, if you've got more specific questions, you need a little bit of individual guidance, don't be afraid to get in touch with us. We've got friendly gear geeks standing by, 877-792-9455 will get you one on the phone, or of course, you can always drop us an email, cs at revzilla.com. I'm Lem, I'm out of here.